we've got our cloud service we've got our vnet the very next thing we're going to create is a storage account now storage accounts are used to store things like file objects that we want to keep and use uh, in uh, azure so if we um, scroll up on the left hand side here click on storage and just like before the storage account here i've already created but i'm going to create um, an additional storage account for using these demonstrations so from the bottom left of the screen if we click new and storage and quick create storage now storage accounts have urls these urls are used so that we can upload and download items from the storage account this url will be available on the public internet and has a core.windows.net um, fqdn what we need to do is fill in the first part now because it's a, um, it's going to be a fully qualified domain name that's going to be accessible on the internet it needs to be unique so we will call this uh, storage account test mgb leads now you see there we've got a red exclamation mark and a message popped up saying this field can only contain lowercase letters and numbers so if you do type a storage account name that is not compatible or that's already in use you'll get that red exclamation mark so we'll try the same thing again but this time in lowercase so we'll see if that name is in use or not uh, now we've got a green tick box so we're good to go the next thing we choose is a location exactly like our cloud service and our vnet we get to choose this location and i'm going to choose western west europe again so my cloud service in west europe my vnet is in west europe and now my storage uh, group is also in west europe by placing everything in the same region they should be able to work together for replication we have three four options here um, whenever we create a, a VHD uh, when we, uh, in Azure so we create a VHD that's going to be used by a virtual machine three copies of that VHD are created and as I write changes to um, the VHD that change is written three times the idea being that if um, one of the VHD uh, fails I have the two other copies of the VHD that I can still work with so imagine a virtual machine that you've created running on one VHD and that VHD is on a blade server in one of Microsoft data centers and that blade server fails well your virtual machine will be reprovisioned on one of the remaining two copies of your VHD file and then a third VHD will be created this is called locally redundant locally redundant and it's the cheapest option when creating uh, virtual machines we also have the choice of zone redundant now zone redundancy is relatively new uh, to the Azure family zone redundancy means that our uh, VHDs our three VHDs will be stored across multiple data centers in the same region as uh, each other so uh, in some of the Microsoft regions Microsoft have multiple data centers uh, these data centers are huge um, so it takes our VHDs and copies three copies to one site and three copies to another site this is not to be confused with geo redundancy now geo redundancy we've had for quite some time uh, in Azure with geo redundancy uh, we have three copies of a VHD file in one data center and then Microsoft chooses a, a paired data center this is a data center that is at least 300 miles away from your uh, the data centers you've chosen so if I've chosen uh, in this case Western Europe to store my VHDs and that Western Europe being data center fails if I choose geo redundancy Microsoft will have another three VHD files in a data center in Northern Europe so if we lose the entire Western European data center my virtual machines will be started using the VHD files in the Northern European data center 
you are paying more for this service. Our final option is read access geo redundant as well. This allows you to give uh, have read access to the VHD files uh, in that geo redundant data center, maybe for reporting services. I'm going to choose locally redundant for um, my storage, uh, which means that any VHD created, there will be just those three copies in that data center. I'm going to tick the box to create this uh, storage account. Now this will take a minute just to uh, run through and create the storage account uh, for me. And what we'll do is we'll just pause the video while that is creating. So now uh, my storage account is created and we can see that the storage account is online. We will uh, access the storage account just by uh, clicking on it. And just like uh, things like the, the um, cloud service and VNet, we get the tabs across the top, uh, the first one being uh, the dashboard. And like all the dashboards, we can use this to monitor different aspects of the, of, um, the storage account. Um, much later on in this video series, we will have a video dedicated to monitoring. What I want to draw your attention to first is the services section um, inside here. And this identifies four different types of storage that are related to this storage account. Now, two of those are tables and queues. Now, these two uh, will get your developers very excited. Uh, tables allow uh, us to store tabular information. So things like uh, usernames, passwords, uh, metadata, um, anything that you'd expect to um, store long term, you want to sort of uh, search against uh, can be stored inside a table the table section uh, queues are used for messaging so in queues uh, we'd find details of uh, messages delivered and messages uh, waiting to be um, sent to various components and applications basically tables and queues mean that as an application developer you don't have to build into your application a messaging system or a uh, table system for storing metadata uh, about users or components application because Azure Storage already provides those for you. Now, we're not going to be talking about tables and queues um, in this section, um, but we may look at them later on. At the bottom of the list, we have the files uh, service. Now, the file service is still in preview and may not appear on your storage account. What you need to do is go to your account settings first then through there, access the preview features section. Um, or alternatively, just search for uh, Azure previews uh, on the Azure portal. And you can uh, sign up your subscription to different preview services. Now, the file service is still in preview at the minute. Now, the file service allows you to create file shares. Now, this might seem basic, but um, if I've got a group of virtual machines, I can, uh, on one of those virtual machines, create a file share, and all these machines can access it. But in order to create the file share, I've had to create the virtual machine. Think of the file service as a platform as a service file share. We sign up for the preview, we uh, get that URL that we can see there, the endpoint URL, and using uh, PowerShell, I can create a file share inside there. And then uh, for my virtual machines, I can use um, uh, NetUse or other uh, utilities to map directly to that file share. So Microsoft managed the file share for us we, once, we, once we create it. Um, and it's like they've given us access to a massive file server for, for us to use. Uh, as we, when we create VMs later on, we'll come back and have a look at that files preview section. The service that we're particularly interested in right now is the BLOB service. Now, BLOBS stands for Binary Large Objects. And the BLOB storage, the BLOB service, allows us to store VHD files uh, inside there. Now, actually, there's two types of uh, BLOB storage that we can work with. Uh, one type, uh, the Block BLOB storage, allows us to store any files we like. So, uh, whether it be image files, text documents or, or whatever other information you want to store inside there. The type that we're much more uh, likely to use is called page blobs. And page blob storage allows us to store the VHD files. 
and that's the default storage type when we create a, a storage account um, for more information on blobs just you know you can you can you can bing that google that to find information on what, what we mean by blobs but essentially it's unstructured storage so we're not storing our VHDs on an NTFS or REFS file system, anything like that. We're storing it on a um, on storage that's designed uh, for sort of very fast read-write access uh, in a random sort of uh, way. Um, now, we'd be very careful to use uh, the term VHD um, in in this section. Uh, for those of you that have, uh, are familiar with on-premise virtualization from Microsoft, so uh, using Hyper-V, uh, you'll know that um, today we support both VHD and VHDX file formats on-premise. Um, well, that's not the case in Azure. In Azure, we can only upload and use VHD files. Now, we'll show you how to upload content to storage in an intermediate video series a little bit later. Uh, but do be aware that if you do want to upload VHD files to Azure, they have to be the VHD format and not VHDX format. Um, also, it's worth noting at this point as well that the VHD files you upload will be uploaded as fixed VHD files. So if you've got uh, dynamically expanding VHDs, they will be converted to fixed VHD files as they upload, but they will um, only upload the uh, use space. Uh, the other thing, uh, just uh, as a little aside here as well, if we're trying to upload a virtual machine into uh, Azure, uh, we only support Generation 1 virtual machines. Generation 2 virtual machines are not supported um, in Azure just yet. So you can see the URLs there, the endpoint URLs. Um, these are used to access the various types of storage um, in this storage account. Uh, on the right hand side we can see also um, the, the, the details of this storage account when it was created its redundancy type uh, and its location and so on now if we scroll up to the top um, as well as uh, the monitor section and the configure section that allows to, to change elements of the storage we've also got containers now in here we can create um, a folder structure to store our different different objects in this storage account. So I'm going to create a single container and call it VHDs. Again, we get the red exclamation mark. So if we do break any rules uh, about naming the containers, it can tell us. And you can see the rules there. So again, we've got to add this in lowercase. Now, when you create a new container, we have a choice of access methods to, to the container. Uh, by default, a uh, container inside the storage account, only the owner of the storage account can access it. Um, but we can make that container uh, an, uh, available to the outside world as well. So the default access is private, only the uh, owner can gain access. But then we've got public container and public blob. Now, essentially, these are, although public are read-only access, to the container public blob will allow people to connect to um, specific VHD files inside this container uh, public container will allow people to see the container metadata as well as the blobs inside there um, but that would be just read access to this uh, container I'm gonna leave mine as private and create that new container inside my storage account and that just takes a minute just to uh, create uh, was created notice again the URL so each uh, container has uh, 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 is added to the URL which means that we can access this container uh, directly and uh, that's an important URL to know if we are uh, uploading uh, items into to storage we upload them directly to a container now uh, my storage uh, now is all is almost ready to 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 go if we go back to the storage count section there's one other thing that we want to just point out on here with my uh, storage count selected uh, at the bottom of the screen we've got manage access keys so if we select manage access keys it shows the storage count name and two uh, keys a primary access key and a secondary access key 
Now these keys will be used by your um, developers, application developers, database developers. Now these keys allow um, write access to the storage account and therefore the containers inside there. So if I was developing an application that had to uh, write information to storage, we would use the appropriate service URLs and use this key as the um, access uh, credentials. Now the reason we have two keys, primary and secondary, uh, because they do do exactly the same thing, is because of this regenerate option on the right hand side. Um, ideally you'll regenerate your keys on a regular basis and you may even have a scheduled task or a workflow that does that for you. But if for example you had an application that was using the secondary access key to write information to the storage and you regenerate that, then that application would lose access. So what you might want to do is give the application the primary key, make sure the application is converted, then regenerate the secondary key, and during the regeneration, because they've, you've assigned them the primary key, they would still have access. Once the secondary key has been regenerated, then that can be hand, handed out. So having two keys means that even during regeneration, people should still be able to gain access to the storage account using the, uh, uh, sec the secondary key or primary key. Um, as we regenerate the other. Um, and again, this, the, your developers will like this um, component. We do not need this if we are the owner of the objects and we're uploading um, BHDs, for example. Uh, we don't need access to these keys. They are, these are primarily used by applications. So we'll leave them as they are for now. So I've got my cloud service. I've got a VNet and I've got a storage account. So uh, the next step then is to create a VM, create a VM, uh, add it to those elements uh, and then um, have a look inside and make sure everything's configured appropriately.